All right, let's start with some, some um, quiz questions. Um, what causes side effects from vaccines? I thought this was relevant, hopefully more relevant to more and more of us as this, uh, as this keeps, as the vaccine rollout continues. Um, essentially what causes, what causes side effects from, from vaccines is the same thing that causes symptoms from illness in the first place. It's your immune system reacting to a foreign substance. The whole idea with the vaccine is that your immune system reacting to that foreign substance trains it to recognize that particular foreign substance and be more um, proactive in eradicating it in the future. Um, but in order to do that, you sometimes will get the same, a lot of the same symptoms, even, um, although they are usually more mild. Um, many of the symptoms from of getting sick of, of a foreign infection are actually caused by your, your immune system trying to fight it off. Um, so a fever is not actually caused by an infection. Your fever is caused by your body trying to, to burn off an infection. Um, so that's, that's essentially, it makes sense why we get a lot of the same symptoms um, because it's your body's way of trying to get rid of that foreign invader. Um, as to why some people get it more um, more severely than others, that's uh, a little bit trickier, mostly just because there are a lot of variables. Genetics can play a role, exactly how much of the vaccine and in what area, even if you, three people get a shot in the, in the shoulder, they can be three different, slightly different amounts of the vaccine or a hit different parts of the muscle and, you know, and travel through the body differently, even if they're overall the same um, vaccine. And so you're going to get slightly different um, symptoms and side effects that way. And a big chunk of it is, is environmental. How healthy are you right now? Um, you know, what, what have you been infected with in the past that's going to help or hurt your body's response, your immune system's response to the vaccine? Um, so your own personal history plays a role as well. <clears throat> that said, I, I do not know enough about immunology to be able to give you more than, than just real basic um, overview of, of how it works. Um, you know, immunology is, is a whole field of study um, and an entire upper division bio class um, that I never did take because it was in the bio department. Um, so... I can't go more in depth than that. The only, the only bio class I took as an elective that I didn't have to take was molecular bio. Um, and that cured me of wanting to take other classes outside of the chemistry department um, because it was a, I believe it was a 7.30 lecture, Monday, Wednesday, 7.30 lecture, Monday, Wednesday, Friday with Friday labs, um, Friday afternoon labs. So, um, I didn't take any more extra classes from the bio department after that. Um, somebody asked a question about, about uh, the color black and dye, black dyes and black paint. Um, and I, know I mentioned that, that a lot of dyes are these conjugated um, aromatic systems that absorb in different regions. Um, black compounds typically are not just one compound that absorbs in the entire visible spectrum. Typically, black paints and dyes are actually a mix of different compounds. So you can cover that entire visible spectrum. Um, and you can, you can actually do that. I've done a lab before where we did um, thin layer chromatography with um, Sharpies, with the ink from Sharpies. And you can look at different brands of black ink. And they will actually have different different um, dyes mixed in and you can actually identify what the brand of ink is based on how the ink separates in a TLC um, because they're all going to be um, they're all going to be slightly different and proprietary you know Sharpie does not they have a patent on their particular black ink dye um, that and other companies are not allowed to use that same mixture of dyes um, so that's, 
it's uh, it's an interesting question. I do not know about some of those like ultra black colors, um, if exactly what those compounds are and how they manage to absorb even more um, because I do know that those are somewhat different in how they work. So those ones might absorb across, but be one compound that absorbs across the entire spectrum. Um, but in all likelihood, it's probably, again, a proprietary mixture of different red, green, blue, yellow dyes that when you add them all up, cover the entire spectrum. Adam? Yeah, I know this may be a complicated question, but what would happen, like you're saying it's proprietary. If you came across it by accident, which is unlikely, but if you did, would you be allowed to use it? No, um, because we know what's in, I mean, a TLC is a really easy experiment to do. And so we can um, just in our labs ourselves, we could figure out exactly what the dyes are that different com um, companies like Sharpie use. But what we're not allowed to do is then take that and make our own ink and sell it as a competitor. Um, so it's not, there's, there's a fine line between in intellectual property, um, between there are some companies that have good enough internal security that they don't patent their stuff. Um, because in order to patent something, you have to disclose to the government exactly what it is that's in there so that you can prove somebody else ripped you off. But the problem with patents is that they're only good for seven years. And so in a lot of things, um, what will happen is you, you file a patent, you make a killing for seven years and try and develop enough brand recognition and enough market share that when your patent runs out, people still go to your product. Um, however, there are other places, there are other products where it's the company does a, you know, does a study and says, well, you know what? I don't think anybody can figure out how we did this anyway. So we're not going to file a patent. And instead, we're just going to continue to make, make money forever, basically, um, and just rely on the fact that people can't figure out what we did. So something like a mixture of inks, that's pretty easy for everybody to figure out. So that's worth filing a patent for. And, and um, I think at this point, it's you know, the reason different brands still have different dyes is mostly just because depending on where that company is based, different dyes are more or less expensive. Um, but something like um, the glue on post-its from 3M, that is proprietary enough. Like no, no other company can figure out how to make that glue work the way it does on a post-it, right? Post-its work differently. Post-it brand post-its work differently than any other sort of notepad like that. That's a case of their internal security is just so good that they never did file a patent for it. And that's why there's no copycats out there for something like, like um, post-it glue. So it's, it's a fine line and, intellect, and there's a reason why, um, I'm trying to think corporate, corporate espionage is still a thing because if somebody could, work at 3M for long enough that they could get access to that recipe, that procedure to make that glue, um, and then manage to leave without being sued and could bring that recipe with them somehow, then all of a sudden all 3M no longer has that particular, you know, stranglehold on the market. Um, the problem is they would be sued into submission over a period for millions and millions of dollars. And even if 3M eventually lost the case, which would not happen, even if they did lose the case, it would be 15 years down the line um, after appeals and fighting. And it would just be millions and millions and millions of dollars of legal fees. They would just bury the other, the competitor in legal fees. And so it's a very fine line when it comes to the, the intellectual property security and whether it's worth it to do a patent or protect it. And if you're a big enough company like 3M, you can protect it. A um, couple of questions that were very relevant to what we're, what we're studying right now. Um, So with reaction with HBr and heat and cold, is it always going to be that the high heat will favor the primary carbon and cold will favor the more substituted carbon? 
high heat will always favor the more substituted alkene because high heat means we're gonna make the thermodynamic product. Low heat or cold conditions means not everything has enough energy to get over that transition state barrier. And so at low temperatures, you're going to favor the kinetic product. And again, sometimes the kinetic product and the more substituted product are the same, but you really have to be paying attention. It's, you can't, what we can say is that high temperatures will always favor the more substituted product, more substituted alkene. Um, and cold will favor the one, two adduct. Right, so it's not the same as saying more substituted at high temperatures, less substituted at cold temperatures. At cold temperatures, you favor the kinetic product, which means you're adding things right next to each other. Right, which is not the same as saying the cold favors the less substituted carbon necessarily. And then last but not least, somebody asked about a ring forming reaction with an aldehyde and a strong base. Um, you can absolutely have a ring forming reaction that, so a ring forming reaction similar to the reaction that was, um, I think it was number two on the, on the quiz. Um, you can absolutely have a carbonyl that is a target for a nucleophile that's on the same molecule just like we had in, in there, instead of having a leaving group that, um, that actually leaves, you could instead have, let's see if I can get to, sorry, I'm trying new, new technology set up here and So if we had five carbons, an aldehyde on one end and an OH on the other end, if you put a strong enough base and you deprotonate that, um, that hydroxyl there, it can come in here and attack the partial positive. Just like we saw with, with uh, Grignard reactions attacking carbonyl groups and hydrides attacking carbonyl groups, a strong base can come in and attack that carbonyl group as well. So if we deprotonate our alcohol to make it a strong base, we'll wind up making, so I put five carbons plus an oxygen. So we'll wind up with, something that looks like this initially. And then if we then expose it to a proton source, we'll get an alcohol. Um, and that's exactly what the ring, um, the ring form, the cyclic form of a sugar molecule is. The reason that you have a ring form and an open chain form of carbohydrates like sugars, is because the, their sugars are a bunch of alcohols um, that have a ketone or an aldehyde on one end of them. And so if you expose it to the right conditions, you can wind up with this re reaction happening pretty much constantly. It's an equilibrium between these two states all the time. Um, so all doses would, are, are sugars that have an aldehyde when they're in their open chain form. Ketoses are sugars that are in their, that are ketone in their, um, open chain form. Um, and this molecule, this the OCHEM term for this molecule that where you've got a, an ether attached to the same molecule as an um, OH, it's called a hemiacetal. Um, and so a hemi, this is the hemiacetal form of this molecule. And it's a lot like a, an enol versus a keto form where you can have them um, 
they're going to be in equilibrium the whole time between the hemiacetal form and the open chain form. Um, so that's absolutely possible. And these ring forming reactions will frequently have, they're all going to have the same general form where you've got a nucleophile on the same molecule as a um, as an electrophile. You just have to have a molecule that's big enough that your nucleophile can be physically separated and far enough from your electrophile that they could make a stable ring when they react. Because if they were closer than, than this, it, they could go one carbon closer, but if you go any closer than that, then these things won't react to form a ring because we're never going to see, I, sh I guess I shouldn't say never, it's not going to be favorable to make a four-sided ring structure, hemiacetal. Um, but more on that next quarter, we'll do a lot with carbonyl chemistry next quarter. And that's most of what next quarter is focused on is carbonyl chemistry and getting into, um, getting into some carbohydrate chemistry as well. Let me switch back to the slides now. All right, any other questions on the quiz? You guys did pretty well on the quiz, Emily? Oh, okay, just a, just a wave. It's the, the Zoom equivalent of, um, of stretching in class and getting called on because you stretch. All right. So you guys answered a question about bicyclic compounds, actually two of them. Um, and we didn't get into exo versus endo products before, before your quiz, but most of you guys um, figured out or read the textbook um, and, and read about this, but we'll go over it as well because I didn't mark anybody down for um, saying that you're gonna get both possible products. Um, if we make a bicyclic compound with, the, with a diene, with a cyclic diene, um, for instance, so cyclopentadiene would be one example. One of the examples from, from the quiz was cyclohexadiene. Um, we wind up with two possible products. And so we kind of have to figure out which of these products we're gonna, are gonna be favored. And so the two terms that we use are endo and exo. Um, just like exothermic and endothermic, exothermic means it gave away heat. Endothermic means it took in heat. Exo, in this case, means that we've got the, our substitutions are pointing away from the larger part of the ring, what they call the larger bridge. So they say it's anti to the larger bridge. And what they mean by that, the larger bridge means if we have a bicyclic product, there's two different bridges between these two sides. So the larger bridge is gonna be the one that has the most carbons attached, right? And the smaller bridge would be the, the single carbon between the two sides. Right, so basically exo points away from the larger part of the molecule and endo is close to the large part of the molecule. Right, so it points into itself basically versus pointing away from the rest of the molecule. Now, what would, our, what would your first instinct be when it comes to predicting which of these possible products we're gonna see more of? How do we usually determine things like which which isomer is made? Something sterics or something? Sterics would be our first our first guess, right? That's the first thing we should consider. Electronegativity winds up playing a big role, though. So we actually are going to have competing effects here. So our first thought, the simplest way to think about it, would be the sterics. That's okay. Sterics, if things are physically larger, they're less likely to be bumping into each other. 
So based on the sterics, we might say, um, we're gonna form the exo. But the problem is, is that the orbitals wind up playing a role. And I know nobody wants to hear about the orbitals being involved because orbitals make things more complicated. Um, the electronic effects though wind up being dominant here. Um, so what we actually wind up seeing is if we bring in a, dien a dienophile that has pi bonds in it, those pi bonds, pi bonds are attracted to other pi bonds because it allows them to sort of overlap their, their p orbitals. And so if you have the endo product, um, we would expect that, so these are our two possible transition states. This bottom transition state is going to make the exo product. And our endo product is made if we, if we point the substitution back towards the other p orbitals. All right, so our endo product though, if you, if you look at your dienophile, it has these pi bonds attached to it. And pi bonds have a, a, specific, um, a specific property called pi stacking. It says that pi bonds will tend to stick together because they're going to wind up putting all of that electron density is going to wind up forming a, some slight orbital overlap between all the different pi bonds. And so what we actually wind up seeing is that for the endo transition states, if we have any electron withdrawing groups on our dienophile, like a cyano group, like an, a carbonyl, like a carboxylic acid, they're going to position the electron withdrawing group over the diene, which is gonna lead us to making the endo product. Um, and our, our textbook doesn't have a good explanation for this, at least in my, in my opinion, um, it's not a very good explanation. So the, but the, um, this resource called Mastering Organic Chemistry, which was literally an OCHEM grad student, it's a lot like Khan Academy, except this stayed more specific to organic chemistry. This, this OCHEM grad student realized that all these undergrads were having such a hard time in organic chemistry that he made a website dedicated to it that's still mostly free. Um, I think there, there are some attempts to sell you some stuff, but Mastering Organic Chemistry has really good resources and tutorials on some of these topics, um, especially if you prefer reading to videos. Um, I've never liked watching YouTube videos to learn things. Probably a big chunk of that is because when I grew up, internet was so slow that you had to wait forever for video to load, but you could load you know, textbooks and, and uh, web pages just fine. Um, so I prefer to read things to learn them, but if you, and so if you are like me and you don't want to, to watch videos or videos are too slow for you, um, Mastering Organic Chemistry is a really good resource that gets into a lot of the higher level stuff um, in a way that's pretty accessible. That said, I, um, I did have a, a brief renaissance of YouTube videos for learning things when I realized that uh, um, when they added that feature where you can play it at double speed. Um, so if you haven't tried that, that's a good way to, to get through things quickly if you can follow what's happening. Um, highly recommend that. All right, so these figures that I took from, from Mastering Organic Chemistry, um, the reason why we wind up forming these endo products are these, oh, would you look at that? Sorry, I'm in a new house and there's a deer on the lawn right outside my window. Just hanging out. My kids must be watching a cartoon or something because it's quiet, so the deer actually came out. Anyway, um, so when we can get that secondary orbital overlap, 
that's going to be favorable for anytime we've got electron withdrawing groups on a diene. Sorry, excuse me, on a dienophile. And electron withdrawing groups in general speed up fields alder reactions because they, when you have these electron withdrawing groups, that makes the pi bond um, in the dienophile winds up being weaker. So these electron withdrawing groups wind up playing a big role because electron withdrawing groups pulling electron density away from the pi bond in the dienophile means it's easier to break the pi bond and form those, um, form those sigma bonds instead. So even though the sterics would predict that we shouldn't see this, in fact, we do, as long as we have any sort of electron withdrawing groups, anything with pi bonds on the dienophile, we're gonna make the endo product as the major product. If we don't have electron withdrawing groups, that's then we're just gonna go off of sterics. If, if we don't have any pi bonds involved, then we're just gonna go off sterics. So let's do some practice. I'll give you guys a few minutes um, to work on these and then we'll go through these the answers here. I'm mute and I'm gonna step away here, but I'll leave you with the deer who is highly concerned now by my dog downstairs. All right, we'll come back and start talking about these products here.
All right. So for this first for this first example for A, we are going to make a bicyclic product. And even though the pi bonds are not shown, those those cyano groups, the nitrile groups have pi bonds. It's a triple bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. So we're going to pre preferentially form the endo product, which means we're going to have something that looks like So there's our, our five-sided ring with the pi bond. And we made a new group here. And it's, they're both going to be pointed downward preferentially. That'd be the exo product and might be easier to see why if I draw out. The cyano groups, so the pi bonds on the cyano groups wind up overlapping favorably with the pi bond um, from the remaining pi group and from the transition state pi bonds. So we're going to preferentially get the endo product. If they're trans, if we have possibility of one can overlap but the other one can't, then it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. So in other words, we're gonna make equal amounts of both possible enantiomers because the So for, for B, for instance, we're gonna wind up with, if we wind up with one down, we're gonna get one, one endo and one exo. All right, and so this one though is gonna get plus EN because there's the possibility that they're that they're switched that it's the front carbon that's that's down that's endo has the endo substitution and the back carbon is exo which so the enantiomer would look like would look like that. If we have a product, a reaction like C, um, where we get, where we have a substitution, an electron withdrawing substitution on one side, but not the other, then the substitution that has the pi bond is going to be endo. And whatever's on the other side is gonna be exo. In this case, we can't tell the difference, right? Because the, um, the possible products are, or we only have two hydrogens that are identical on the other side. So we're not gonna make it, it's not gonna make a difference there. So our product in this for C, is going to have the aldehyde and in the endo position. And it wouldn't be plus en then. Uh, so we wouldn't, it's with these bicyclics, it's usually a better idea rather than saying plus EN, because they frequently have, will have more than one stereo center with these bicyclic products. So it's usually a better idea to draw both of the possibilities rather than saying plus EN, because we're not gonna flip every single stereo center. We're only gonna flip um, one or two of them. So the other possible product then
would be and might as well draw it facing the right way. Would be the endo substitution on the back carbon. You will still get some amount of the exo product for these, but they're gonna favor the major product is going to be the endo product if you have those electron withdrawing groups. So for D, we have a more complicated um, diene, but it's still going to be the same basic principle. So start by drawing your bicyclic structure and then add in the um, sub substituents wherever you need to. So we're gonna start by making our bicyclic structure, but we have a sulfur as our bridge between the front and back instead of a carbon. And then on the dienophile, we had two methoxy groups. And those don't have exo versus endo, right? Because the carbons that they're attached to are sp2. They're attached to that remaining alkene group, which means there's no up or down. If those are, that's a more or less planar carbon that they're attached to. So then on the other side, we would then say, okay, well, I can have one exo and one endo because they're trans relative to each other, these acid groups. So we'd wind up with, we have one exo, we have one endo, plus the same, the, we won't call it an enantiomer because again, there's a total of four different um, stereo centers here. So it's just gonna be flipping the exo and endo products. So look something like I'll switch colors. Right, so it gets really, it gets a little tricky to see what's happening when we have the bonds crossed over like this. But this is showing that the front carbon, the structure on the right hand side is anyway, is showing that the Front carbon has a carboxylic acid attached in the exo position. The rear carbon has a carboxylic acid attached in the endo position. And yeah. Um, for that one, would, if we just wrote plus an uh, en, would that work for that? Or do you want us to draw out the other structures? So I didn't mark you guys down on it on the quiz, but I, it's, a better, it's a better solution to draw both structures in this case. If you've got more than two stereo centers and they're not all flipping, only two of them are flipping, um, then it's a better idea to draw both of the structures. Plus, we'll give you more pro practice drawing your bicyclic structures, right? Which we could all use, myself included. 
Yes. Thank you. No problem. And again, so for E, if we don't have, I'm not going to go through E and F right now, um, but I will do them at the beginning of lab if you guys want, or for um, practice at uh, the beginning of lecture on Thursday. Um, if you only have your, your electron withdrawing group on one side, then you're going to wind up putting that electron withdrawing group in the endo position on each of the two carbons, right? So you're going to get both enantiomers, the one that puts it on carbon one and the one that puts it on carbon two. All right, we're going to go past the Diels Alder reaction for right now. Um, and we'll come back and we'll practice with it more to, in order to talk about electrocyclic reactions. So electrocyclic reactions are similar to the Diels-Alder reaction in that they don't go through a radical or a charged intermediate. It's going to be a bunch of electrons moving more or less in a circular mo motion. And what the result is, is that we're going to wind up breaking a pi bond to make a new sigma bond. So Diels Alder reaction broke two pi bonds to make two sigma bonds. And that's when we gave it, made it a cycloaddition. These electrocyclic reactions, we're going to, we only need to break one pi bond and we're going to make one sigma bond. And so what that looks like is that most of the carbons that have these pi bonds are going to stay sp2. Um, and we wind up making a product that is, is a conjugated diene. We just lost the pi bond on the end, the two ends wind up reacting together in order to make this, this ring structure. We typically only see this if we're going to be making a cyclo group that is six carbons. We can do it with four carbons, but we wind up making something that's a really strained structure. And so it won't stick around like that for very long. The equilibrium favors being in the open form. Um, and we don't see this with five carbon systems because how do you have three pi bonds with five carbons? Right, so you can't, you really are going to see this predominantly with six carbon systems. You can see it with eight carbon systems as well. And we'll deal, talk about how to deal with that. And those eight carbon systems um, may wind up forming a, um, a six-sided ring or an eight-sided ring. We'll talk about how we can tell the difference and, and how to predict which of those is more favorable um, when we come back from break here. So, we're going to go through a couple of slides here before break, and then we'll go over them again because they're tricky. Um, because we have to focus on the orbital shapes and phases in order to, to explain this, this graph right here. If we have three pi bonds and we have the substitutions on the end, so it's the same molecule right here, except that we we added methyl groups on the end. So it's eight carbons, but there's only three pi bonds. And so this system, we can actually control when it goes through this electrocyclization, whether we make the cis or the trans product by controlling the conditions. So it's a little bit like a kinetic control versus thermodynamic control, but it winds up being orbital control. We can control whether we make the cis product. We, if we add heat to the system to catalyze the, the electrocyclization, we're going to make the cis product in this case. If we use light to catalyze the reaction, we get the trans product. And not just like major minor, like a hundred percent, which means something weird is going on. 
because if we then changed, if we started from the cis product and shined light on it, it'll actually switch from being both of these methyls facing away from each other to the two methyls facing towards each other. So we can switch back and forth between stereoisomers by controlling whether we use heat or light to catalyze these reactions. And the fact that light is involved is a clue that it's gonna have to be, have to do with the orbitals, right? Because light promotes electrons from the HOMO to the LUMO. It promotes electrons from an occupied orbital to an unoccupied orbital. Now, when we saw light for things like peroxy groups or for, as, a, as a catalyst for um, free radical bromination, we were promoting electrons from, so we looked at, we go to a whiteboard here. If we looked at bromine, and we shined light on it, we wound up with the free radicals splitting up, right? And we get two bromine radicals. The reason that that happened is because bromine has a, a it has a single bond between the two state, between the two atoms, and the molecular orbital setup looks like this, where we wind up, if, if we bring these two things close together, these two atoms close together, we wind up forming a sigma bond orbital, right? So that should look somewhat familiar, even if you wouldn't have been able to draw this on your own. It kind of looks like diagrams that we've seen before. But every time, and what that looks like, that sigma bond looks like, You've got a bromine that has an sp3 orbital, and that bromine's sp3 orbital is pointing towards the sp3 orbital from another bromine. And they're all the same phase, so they overlap and you get a sigma bond. But every time you bring two orbitals close together and they can form a favorable in phase overlap, there's also the possibility that one of them is out of phase. So basically, if you can have constructive interference, you can also have destructive interference. Where one of these is the right phase and the other one's not. And so remember, that's what we called a anti-bonding orbital, which we don't, which we signify with an asterisk. So for sigma bonds, the reason that shining light on them turns them into free radicals is you wind up moving one of these electrons from the bonding orbital to the anti-bonding orbital. And if you don't have electrons in the bonding orbital, you wind up with that bond breaking. What this looks like in terms of pi bonds is the, the gap between those, the, the pi bond and the pi anti-bonding orbital winds up being in the right range that if you shine light on it, you can break the pi bond just by moving electrons into that anti-bonding orbital. And when you move electrons into the anti-bonding orbital, that's the equivalent of breaking a bond. That's not what I wanted. All right, so we're gonna take our break there and we're gonna come back and talk about using what the HOMO, predicting what the HOMO and the LUMO look like and using that to predict the, which product we're going to make based on whether we shined light on it or not. Right, so let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at nine o'clock and we'll put some of this into play.
All right, so let's go ahead and start coming back here so we can start talking about how this works. So with the idea in mind that, that a bond is just formed by overlapping in phase orbitals, we can actually explain this pretty well if we just use that frontier, frontier orbital theory, um, which was that idea that the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the LUMO, the lo lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, are going to be controlling most of the reactivity. If we look at that, at that hexatriene, one, three, five hexatriene, where we have alternating um, alternating pi bonds, the HOMO looks has this overall shape. So the, the if you look at the three possible ways you can have the um, pi electrons, you could have the pi electrons set up so that they're all the same phase, so that they all look the same. So you have One, two, three, four, five, six. So the, the lowest energy state would be that if we had them all with the same phase, so that they all had their shaded versus unshaded or red and blue are showing the same thing, that would be the lowest energy poss possible state. The next lowest would be if we added just one node one place where they switch phase. So the next lowest energy would look like, we're still gonna have six of these P orbitals. But if we add one spot in the middle where they switch phase, then we've, that's, that's that node. We added a node right in between here. So on the left, the shaded part is down. On the right, the shaded part is up. And we always have to add it in a way so it's symmetrical on both sides of the node. So here's lowest energy. Second lowest. And then if we add two nodes, we get this shape here where it alternates twice. And so that we have three possible ways. If we added a fourth node, that would be higher in energy. The more nodes we add, the higher in energy. So our highest occupied molecular orbital <clears throat> has two nodes because we have to put two electrons into each of these before they can be moved to the next one, right? So if we have a total of six electrons, two of our electrons go into the lowest energy, two electrons go into the second lowest, and two electrons go into the third. And then we've used all of our pi electrons. We only have six pi electrons if we have three pi bonds. Right, so all of this is to prepare us for the idea that, okay, if we, we can predict what the HOMO looks like just by drawing these figure eights and adding in nodes until we run out of electrons. Right, so that's how we know what the HOMO looks like here. Sean, I'm sorry, what is the HOMO? Highest occupied molecular orbital. Right, and it's the highest occupied because the, the most stable state has two electrons in it. So it's occupied, it has electrons in it. The second lowest state has two electrons in it. It's occupied as well. The third lowest state has two electrons in it. And then we've used all of our electrons. So it's the highest energy occupied orbital. 
because we've now used all six of our electrons that are in the pi bonds. And so if we know that the, that the HOMO is going to look like this, is going to have two nodes in it, when we look at what that looks like in terms of lining these things up, we're going to have phase, if we call blue, phase up. We have phase up and then it hits a node and then it's phase down and then it hits a node and then it's phase up. What that means is in order to make a new sigma bond, we need these two blue sections to overlap with each other. And it, that means that if we want the two blue bonds at the end to overlap with each other, we have to rotate them the right direction. We have to rotate them both inward. In order to get the two blue sections to overlap with each other. And if we do that, the methyl groups have to rotate as well. And so the methyl groups if we're rotating the orbitals so that the two blue sections can overlap with each other, if we call the, my fingers are the, the pi bonds that are gonna try to overlap, my thumbs are the methyl groups. When they overlap, both of the methyl groups wind up pointing the same direction. So we started with them facing outward when they rotate to overlap, both of the methyls point upward. This completely explains why when we just add heat for this to happen, <clears throat> we only get one of these stereoisomers. Because we're only going to, if we start on the left-hand side and we, and we have those orbitals positioned the way they are in the HOMO, when they go to overlap with each other, both of the methyls are going to wind up facing the same direction. Right, so we wind up with something that looks like this. This is showing it to turning it so that the red overlaps instead of the blue, but it's the same effect. One of them rotates clockwise, the other one rotates counterclockwise so that we get the same phase of orbital pointing towards each other. And that results in the methyl groups both pointing, in this case, down. And so we get the cis product where both of the methyl groups are fit on the same side of the ring structure because we have to have them rotate in a way to, to put the, the orbitals, the in-phase orbitals overlapping. Um, and there's a question about what it, the definition of a node and a node just in terms of, of um, waves. If you have standing waves, a, a node is a place where the waves cancel each other out and there's exactly no amplitude. So a node, in other words, is a place where it goes from being positive to negative. And when these things rotate back and forth, not rotate, when they vibrate back and forth, you, that node will still be there, right? So in the context of this class, the node is where the phase flips. So it's not actually where, uh, it's not saying that there's a node is where a P orbital flips relative to the others. The node is actually the place in between 
the orbitals where they go from being up to down, for instance, or positive to negative. Right, so for any of you who play string instruments, the node is where you see harmonics. So on a guitar, a guitar string, you can have a standing wave that looks like it looks like this. That would be just a regular open string. You can also have a standing wave. It looks like this, where both sides of it are vibrating up and down, but in the middle, nothing is vibrating. So that'd be your first harmonic. If you put your finger on the 12th fret of a guitar, that's exactly halfway between the two ends of the string, and it will vibrate, but that one spot right in the middle won't vibrate at all. You could also add another node on the same string, see if I can do thirds. Visually, that's all right. Adding two nodes in, and that's what this is. We have two nodes added, so we have two places where where the phase flips from up to down or positive to negative, red to blue. And so by, if we know how many electrons we have and how many pi bonds we have, we can figure out how many nodes there have to be in the HOMO. And if we know how many nodes there have to be in the HOMO, we can figure out which way things need to rotate to make this new sigma bond, right? And so this is what's, this case is what's known as disrotatory because they're rotating in opposite directions. One's rotating clockwise, the other one's rotating counterclockwise. And the result is if one's clockwise and one's counterclockwise, they're still gonna move towards each other. And then you just move the methyls with them when you do that. If we add another node, so this was our homo, right? Our homo, we said, okay, based on the, on the way all of these look, um, or on the fact we have three different pi bonds, and that means we have, we need three occupied orbitals. Our homo is going to look like this. Well, if we added another node, that's no longer an occupied orbital because it's higher in energy. But we can say, okay, if we look at the energy here, we say zero nodes, one node, two nodes, This was our homo. Because when we put electrons in, we run out of electrons when we get to the state that has two nodes in it. Higher in energy, we get to three nodes. And that makes it our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So if we shine light on this system, we're not dealing with the HOMO anymore. We actually are dealing with the LUMO instead. And that means the LUMO, instead of having the, the carbons on the end facing this, having the same phase, their, their phase is pointed in opposite directions. Because we had to add another node. We had to add another place where it split, switches from positive to negative or red to blue. 
And that means at the end, we get this system where instead of both of the blue are up and we need to do this, we wind up with one blue up and one red up. Or, and I can't even bend my hands to make it face the right way. If I've got my, if my thumbs are still the methyl groups and I want my fingers to overlap to make a new sigma bond, now all of a sudden they need to rotate the same direction. Again, I'm not that flexible and my arms aren't that long. So this is hard to do. But to get that to happen, that's what they call con-rotatory. If you look down at the bottom. So dis-rotatory meant one had to rotate clockwise, one had to rotate counterclockwise in order to get the orbitals to overlap. So we can think of that as both rotating inward. Con-rotatory, they're both going to be rotating the same direction. And that means that if you started with your methyls pointing out and they're both rotating clockwise, you get one methyl up and one methyl down. Right, so these two ideas completely explain this figure. Because when you're just using heat, you're only looking at the homo. If you're using light, you're looking at the LUMO. So to go from having them pointed outward, if it's the HOMO we're talking about, we're dealing with two nodes, which means the orbitals at the end have the phase pointed the same direction. And it's gonna be Disrotatory. They're both, they're going to, one's going to rotate clockwise and the other one's going to rotate counterclockwise in order to get them oriented the right way. If you shine light on it, one's up and one's down. So then they both have to rotate clockwise to get that overlap to happen, which means if you started with the two methyls pointed outward, you get one up and one down. All right, so these are this is what's known as the Woodward Hoffman rules. Um, and the Woodward and Hoffman are both very names in in chemistry. I mean, they won Nobel prizes, so can't get much larger than that. Um, and actually Hoffman, the guy on the right, who is still alive to the best of my knowledge, um, Hoffman was the one who shared his Nobel prize with Fukui from Japan. Remember, I, we talked about how the guy from Japan didn't get any respect. He was the Rodney Dangerfield of the, of the chemistry community. Um, Hoffman was the one who did the research that supported what Fukui had been saying for 30 years. So because of the Woodward Hoffman rules, Fukui got his recognition in the 80s. <clears throat> and so what that, what the, the Woodman Hoffman, Hoffman rules, sorry, Woodward Hoffman rules, um, are not, they're basically this table, which I find it easier to draw the orbitals and do and show the orbitals rotating the right way, rather than remembering all the different, um, remembering this table and then what all the different terms mean. Because all this is really doing, all the Woodward Hoffman rules really do is explain and give you sort of a shortcut to, okay, if you apply heat, things are gonna rotate this way. If you apply light, they're gonna rotate this way. All right, so, and you can also think of it, if, instead of four pi electrons, you can think of it as two, pi bonds. 
instead of four pi electrons. And really it's gonna be, an, it's any even number of pi bonds. Thing is, we don't really do four pi bonds in a row because that winds up not, not being very stable. But if you think of three pi bonds instead of six pi electrons, we get the same net result. And again, I find it easier to draw the figure eights rather than remember these rules with the vocab. I find it easier to, to draw the figure eights. And the, the easiest way to remember that is that if you have three pi bonds, your homo has two nodes. If you have two pi bonds, your homo has one node. I'll say that again. You're always going to have one fewer node than pi bonds in the homo. Yeah, that's not what I wanted. So for the homo, one fewer node than pi bonds. For the, lo for the LUMO, same number nodes as pi bonds. RJ? Uh, this is just a random question, but it what would happen if you did a reaction with heat and light? Like, it, do you have they ever done that? Is that like a thing? So we, we typically, you would get a mixture of the two in that case, right? Some of the molecules are going to react, have the homo react. Some of the molecules are going to have the lumo react. And since usually in chemistry, we, we want to limit the number of possible products rather than get all the possible products. We want to try and limit it to this way or that way. Um, it's, it has been tested and you do in fact get a mixture of the products like you would expect. And you can vary the ratio even if you have a little bit of light, but a lot of heat or if you have a little bit of heat, but a lot of light, you can kind of control how much of the two products you get that way. Um, but it just starts getting more complicated than we want it. Ideally, we want to keep these things as simple as possible. So we get as few products as possible. All right, so let's use this, these ideas. If we have this molecule and we expose it to light, what is our product going to be? It's gonna be trans relative to each other on the ring. So based on this, we have three pi bonds and it's photochemical, not thermal. Photo means light. So con rotatory, so if they're both, so what it's saying is if they start with them pointed outward, con rotatory takes the two things facing outward and they both go clockwise. So they're both going clockwise. I can't bend that way. Let's see, how can I do this? They're gonna do that. 
So we are in fact gonna get the trans product. Oh, there we go, I can't do that, do it like that. Um, and so what that, because what that would look like is our, if we had the, the homo for this case, we have three pi bonds, so our homo has two nodes. So our homo looks like we're going to have a node here and a node here. And it doesn't matter which one you shade versus leave empty because all that really matters is that at the, the ones at the end are pointing up, are pointing the same direction. And our LUMO has one extra node in it. So three nodes. And if we start with our shaded part up, then we switch because we hit a node. And we switch because we hit a node. We switch because we hit a node. So for our, for our homo, the end of the ring would look like, so regardless of what the rest of the ring looks like, we only care what's happening at the end because that's where our new sigma bond is gonna be. So for our homo, it would look like this. For our LUMO, and that's what we care about for this one because, because this one has light. Light tells us that we're dealing with the LUMO. If so, if we're dealing with the LUMO, we need to rotate. The same direction in order to get them. To both be pointed the same way, because remember, we need the orbitals with the same phase to overlap. All right, so. That allows us again to, to be able to predict whether we get the cis or the trans product based on are we shining light on or not. Right, so the product we would get here for this particular molecule we broke one pi bond we formed one new bond and we're going to get the trans product because they were both pointed outward and then we rotate them the same direction both clockwise so we get one up and one down Right. If it was the same molecule with heat, we would get the trans the cis product. And if we started from having them both facing the same direction, 
that's going to change our product too. So you have to think about it in terms of the rotation rather than just heat leads to cis and light leads to trans. It depends on where you start. Did they start with them facing the same direction or did they start with them both pointing outward? And then how did things rotate? So the, the Woodward Hoffman rules don't really even save us that much time because you still have to think about does con rotatory give me the cis or the trans product, right? So it's, it's a neat trick and a, a good summary, but for my money, thinking about it in terms of nodes and orbitals is just is easier because you're going to have to draw it out like this anyway. Casey? Yeah, Sean, as this might be reaching a little bit, but what would it look like mechanistically to create that ring? Um, the mechanism is actually really straightforward. I threw it off. Oh, I'm sorry, my finger. Okay, fat fingers on the little touch screen, so let's wind up with going forward and backward at the same time. Um, the mechanism just looks like this you got to show the pi bonds moving and that's going to show the bonds breaking and forming, but this doesn't answer the question of which product do we get on its own because we still need to decide cis versus trans if there's anything attached there. But it's just, you show um, one of your pi bonds that's at the end of the molecule, we show that as, as moving towards the other end of the chain and the other two, the other pi bonds just move away from that to make room for it basically. So you wind up with the two ends getting connected and whatever other number of pi bonds you have just sort of move over to make room. So if, I, if all I did was ask for the mechanism, this is good. But if I want you to show me, are you gonna make the cis versus the trans, then you've gotta think about which direction of the orbitals pointing, is there light or heat, right? So that's where we see the difference really, is in, it's in predicting which of the stereochemical or this, the um, stereoisomers are we going to make. And so beyond that, the way we can the, the way we can make it more complicated is one, just start with a more complicated looking molecule that's still gonna follow our same rules, which isn't that bad really, right? We're used to dealing with that. Adding our groups doesn't change the rest of the, the reaction for the most part, just changes how, how you draw the product. The tricky thing, the trickiest, way to ask this reaction is if we're breaking the ring structure to form more pi bonds. Basically, if we're doing the reaction in reverse, because we have to use the same rules. If I go back to that summary slide here. If we used heat to get the, the cis product, if we then take the cis product and shine light on it, we get the opposite stereoisomer. Because if it was disrotatory, because we used heat to begin with, if it was disrotatory to do this, and then we break it by using light, it's gonna rotate. You go from being disrotatory to conrotatory. And so that, that is where the, I guess that is the, the place where the Woodward Hoffman rules wind up being useful in this form is when we're breaking the ring structure up. If we're making a system that has four pi electrons and we shine light on it, it's gonna be disrotatory, meaning one, one rotates inward and one rotates, or they both, 
are going to, one's going to rotate clockwise, the other one counterclockwise. So for B here, we're going to be making a system that has four pi electrons and we're, and we're doing it with heat. So in terms of the orbitals, let's see. So, So we're starting here and we're applying heat. And just a reminder, if you see delta as a catalyst, delta means heat in chemistry. So there's your shorthand. So if we're starting with something that looks like that looks like this, where we have our methyls both pointed up, and then we had the rest of the ring structure. We're trying to get to the normal HOMO. So instead of starting from the HOMO and rotating, we're getting back to the HOMO, right? And so if the, the HOMO, when it was um, two pi bonds, we have one fewer node than pi bonds, right? So the, the, before it formed the ring structure, the HOMO looked like this. So two pi bonds, therefore the HOMO looks like this. So to get this system back to this, we need the ones that are overlapping need to be pointed in opposite directions when we're done in order to get back to the normal homo. So we're gonna have to rotate one of them has to rotate. Um, they both are going to be either both clockwise or both counterclockwise. But either way, when we break this, we're gonna wind up forming something that looks like that. This is the stereoisomer we would make because we started with them overlapping and then we need it and cis, the methyls point to the same direction. Then we had to rotate both of them the same direction in order to get to the homo. Which means we wind up with both of the methyl groups pointing the same direction after the rotation happens. Right, so opening the rings is the hardest part of this. Opening the rings is the trickiest thing in this chapter, if you ask me. And it's basically just undoing forming the rings. But that means you have to think about where am I trying to go? The nice thing about forming the ring structures is you start with the homo and the lumo and like, okay, I just need to make them overlap. Undoing that means you have to start with them overlap and get back to the right orbitals which is really tricky. All right. I'm going to give you guys, we will start by going through these in lab today. 
and then lab your lab assignment is going to be i'm going to give you your final product project for lab um which is basically going to be a bunch of a, a synthesis problem that involves some stoichiometry and molecular weights so i'm going to give you each an individual you guys will each have your own synthesis problem and you guys can feel free to work with each other because two of you want to work together and solve two synthesis problems as a group rather than solving one that's fine with me and again i'll go over this later um I, in more detail but your your final lab project is going to be okay here's a table of stuff that's in the stock room here's the product you're trying to make how do you make it and so you have to figure out what you could start from that's in the stock room that's in this table what reactions you would need to go and the, your final answer is okay how do i make 10 grams of product so that means you have to work backwards and say okay if i want 10 grams of product and i have to do this reaction that has a 75 percent yield how many grams of that of reactants did I need to start with? And then if that reactant, if it was a multi-step process and you had to um, start from, from, you know, you have these, these reactions happening in a row. And if you can say, okay, every reaction is gonna give me a 75% yield, you have to work backwards using stoichiometry and percent yields to figure out how much pro, um, reactant you needed to start with. How much precursor did you need at the beginning in order to get to 10 grams of product at the end? So it's a problem solving. It's all the math is basically going to be stoichiometry and molecular weights and percent yields. Um, and then it's going to be you sort of, okay, at writing out a simple procedure that's along the lines of start from cyclohexane with 30 grams of cyclohexane and then you brominate it and you're going to get bromocyclohexane and then you're going to do this and then you and that gives you um cyclohexanol and then you're going to have cyclohexanol react with ethanol to make a uh an ether or something like that right and like i said everybody will have their own randomly assigned molecule to make with this right so work on these practice problems We'll go through these at the beginning of class at lab, and then we'll talk about the projects more. All right, everybody have a good morning. I have office hours at 1030 if anybody wants to ask questions, otherwise hang out, hang on to those questions until, um, until lab at one, and I'll see you there. Thanks, John. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Have a good morning.